It's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 66 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them, too. Don't forget. We brew coffee from a little coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Some good, strong breakfast blend. We got some flavor creamer, so it goes well with it. <laughs> We're ready. Are you ready to sip some coffee and chat? Always. Let's do it. So how are you doing? Okay. Happy to see March. March is here. March is also Women's History Month, which is very important to us. Yes. And we should talk about it. We're going to be spotlighting a very important woman every week in history or in present that may make history. Right. Chicken ladies that have made a substantial contribution to society, to the chicken keeping world. Yeah. 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 And so we have a special guest that we're going to be bringing you every week. Right. And we're kicking off with a really amazing guest. We'll tell you about in just a little bit. Yeah. Here. We'll get to that in a little bit. So I'm getting over a cold. Uh huh. So if my voice sounds a little different today, that is why. Luckily, it's temporary. It's not COVID. Yay. No, right. <laughs> We've had enough of that. I tested COVID negative, but I've been sick for multiple days. One day, did not move from the sofa. So that's weird for me. Yeah. But I'm feeling better. Back on the mic. Excellent. March 20th is a day on the calendar that everybody needs to put a big red star on. Spring. First day of spring. Yeah. First day of spring, I'm going out there and like just doing a dance of joy all around the yard. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we don't get snow on that date or something. I am going to go out there, Gertie in hand, and just be like, yeah. We do have Gertie in the studio with us again right yes. now. She's she's just hanging out right now. She is chilling. She's what I like to call chillaxing she's, in the stroller. She's staring at me. Does she want something? She always stares at Ann Holly. Gertz. She's like, that's the woman who tube fed me for a week. <laughs> She actually looks like she's about to go to sleep. She does. She's not sleepy. Yeah. She's yeah. like, you guys bore me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, girl. She's like, wait, can you take some more videos or pictures of me? I am a movie star. She is, and she's beautiful. So you have anything going on in your world? I'm trying to get everything ready because I know what always happens is that when spring hits, it explodes. Yeah. So I'm trying to have my brooder set up and ready to go, deep clean all the coops, get the house where I want it. You know, feel like I have a handle because that first week in March when the chicks arrive, life is going to be exploding and I just want to be on top of things for a change. Well, you only have a few weeks to do all that. I know. It's going to be here before you know it. Yeah, I'm working. We've been working on chicks. Has everybody out there been working on figuring out if you're getting new chicks this year? When we work on chicks, does that mean we look up more chicks that we wish we'd ordered? Yes. Yeah, that's what it means. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Joe knows we're getting new chicks, but he's just like, oh, okay, at this point. It's no surprise after, you know, happy wife, happy life, eight or nine, 10 years, yeah. whatever, of getting chicks. Yep. He's like, okay, we're getting chicks. <laughs> it's happening. Gertie is in a new habit of, we have the garage fridge, as you know. Right. In our garage, Gertie has a big plush bed, a big pop-up with the heater in it, <laughs> her food, water, a bunch of, I mean, we go out there all the time with her. Right. And we have the garage fridge, which yes. Gertie has learned that's where food is. Yeah. So as soon as you walk into the garage, she chases you to the fridge if you yes. go to the fridge and waits because that's where I keep the kale. She does. Did she do that to you? Yes. And I could not find the kale. So I may have come back in the kitchen and taken a blueberry to go out and give it to her. So, yeah. Oh, she heard it. She, she looked at oh, me. Oh, she's looking at me. And Holly, where's my blueberry? <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So she's kind of cute. She's adorable. She's a welcome member sitting around the table. Uh -huh. We just need a tiny cup of coffee for her. I don't think we want to go down that road. <laughs> She'd be in our coffee all the time. She would be noisier than Charity is, too. Right. Okay, so should we just take a minute to ask everybody a huge favor? If you're listening to our show and loving it, if you could head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a written review, it does amazing things for the growth of our show. We love reading them, and it's amazing. Thank you to our newest reviewers. Really, really fantastic stuff. Yeah, we were on the phone the other weekend talking about that. Yeah. If you're looking for other ways to support the podcast, you can visit our Etsy shop, check out the t-shirts that we have on offer there. You can also subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. You can share episodes on your social media. 
You can become a patron of the show. Visit patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Check out our levels of membership, which include a free bonus episode and a monthly Zoom call for the upper tier. Yes. It's so much fun too. It is a lot of fun. The other thing you can do to help support the podcast is go to our show notes and buy products from our sponsors using our affiliate links. It usually gives you a good discount. Yay! We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. From now until the end of February, you can receive 20% off if you're a first-time buyer. I'm a long-time subscriber, and my flock love the healthy and nutritious grubs, plus all products chip free If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. This offer does not apply to subscriptions and cannot combine with any other discounts. It's a great time to try Grubly Farms if you haven't yet. Use the code COFFEE20. Try it today. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then, yeah. Let me take a minute to tell everybody about the Chicken Love Box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the Mega Box. Tons of useful products and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with the chicken tea. It's so cute and so soft. In the February box, I absolutely love the comb balm and the Valentine's Day chicken mug. I adore that chicken pathogen poster from Chicken DVM. And that cookie, it's so adorable. I am never going to eat it. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your purchase and shipping is always free. For the month of February, a portion of all sales will be donated to Adopt a Bird Network. It's such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Okay, so now it's about the time for the Green Spotlight. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Well done. Oh, that made my throat hurt. <laughs> So this week, we are spotlighting a bird that has some royal connections. It is royalty. This is one that we've been ooing and aahing over for a very long time. This is another one of those breeds that I've wanted for years and just didn't see a way to fit it in. And you could see it in your flock. Oh, of course I could see it in my flock. (laughs) All chickens can fit in my flock. So this week, we are talking about the Jubilee Orpington. Because for one thing, it's Queen Elizabeth's Jubilee year. It's the Platinum Jubilee year for Queen Elizabeth II. Yes. That's right. She is the longest reigning monarch of England. And go women. Go, yeah, right. Go woman power. So this is the Jubilee Orpington. Right. It's royal. It's from England. And it really is a spectacular bird. We'll tell you all about them. But the beautiful Jubilee Orpington was developed in England during the late 1800s. Yep. In early 1897, this variety was introduced as the Diamond Jubilee Orpington to honor Queen Victoria's 60 years on the throne. Exactly. And at the time, she was the first English monarch to reach this milestone. 60 years. I mean, look at it this way. Queen Elizabeth, 75. That's 15 more. Exactly. So that's where the, that's where the Platinum Jubilee comes yeah. in. Yeah. So, yeah. Queen Elizabeth II has done the Diamond Jubilee and the Platinum. So I want a Platinum Jubilee Orpington. Yeah. Anyway, so the Jubilee was originally bred by William Cook. Which we talked about in our Buff Orpington, the second episode, which seems so long ago. It really does. So oh yeah, my goodness. he and his family were the same people that developed the original Black Orpington as well right. as the Buff and several other color varieties. We should say the Black Orpington was the original, yes, very first Orpington. Even though Buff is like so well known, and basically when you think of Orpington, you instantly think of a Buff. Yes, I think that is by far the most common color. It's like because of popularity. Right. But the one they developed was a Black. Yes, it was. And really, I think that one has gone on to live in the Australorp the Australian Orpington. Because when you go to buy an Orpington, you don't hear about the black you Orpington that much. You almost never see a black Orpington unless yeah. you're buying from a breeder. The white as well. So I just wanted everybody to know that the black Orpington was the first. It was the first, followed shortly by the buff. And what amazed me is how many forms of the Orpington they created. So we said that the Jubilee was bred by William Cook and debuted in 1897. Correct. Well, William Cook died seven years later. He didn't get to enjoy his... You know, he did actually. He took several of them to America to sell. We'll get into that more a little bit later. The Americans weren't very high on the Orpingtons when William Cook brought them over. But he convinced them, and really, I mean, does it take much convincing? No. These giant balls of feathers that are so sweet? I mean, me, I am the queen of Orpingtons over here. (laughs) 
they go broody a lot. Let me tell they you, I'm, I'm constantly in a nest box saying, please I know. go out. But Orpingtons are the quintessential American chicken right now, even though they're British. They're like the golden retriever of the chicken world. I mean, they definitely are one of the sweetheart breeds. There's no question about it. I actually think that the Rhode Island Red is more quintessential than the Buff Warpington. But the Buff Warpington is an absolute staple of the American chicken yard now. It is. But the difference for me is that the Buff Warpington is the ultimate family chicken. Yep, absolutely. Where Rhode Island Red tends to not be that way. I think only if you have one or two in your flock. Yeah, you we've really said that over and over. Yeah. yeah. If you have a whole flock of Reds, when we started out, we had a whole flock of reds. Holy moly. <laughs> so back to the Jubilee. When you do some Googling on the Jubilee Orpington, you see all these different combinations that could possibly be the foundation breeds. Right. I'm here to tell you that most of them are wrong. What did you see? Well, I saw speckled Sussex. Which would make sense. Which would make sense because it looks like a chubby speckled Sussex. Right. Well, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think it does. So the poultry historian Lewis Wright, luckily, he actually published part of a letter from William Cook's son, who was also William Cook. Right. And he explains the breeds they used to develop the Jubilee. And you found this in a history book versus anywhere online, correct? Yeah. yeah. This is in one of my many books. You can get some information online, absolutely. Yeah. But I'm a librarian and a historian wrapped into one, which means I go to books every single time. Yeah. And a lot of times, if I can, from the books, I go to an original source. Yeah. Which is why we can say that our history is meticulously researched. So, according to William Cook the Younger, the original crosses were with Buff Orpington pullets. Okay. And they looked for the darkest. Right. So, ones that were more of a red or more of a brown and not that classic golden buff. Right. So, they grabbed dark reddish-brown Orpington pullets. And they crossed them with red Dorking cockerels, mm -hmm. who actually are quite pretty. And so they selectively bred them for a couple of generations, and they got rid of the Dorking fifth toe and the floppy cone. Okay. Just by heavily selecting. Right. These F1, these first generation pullets, were then crossed with golden spangled Hamburg rubes. And through generations there of selective breeding, they got rid of the white earlobes and the rose comb. And the result is, is an Orpington. Jubilee Orpington. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And at first I was like, wow, that's a stretch. But I could see yeah. like, what we've learned about the way barring is passed through the mail. Incomplete yes. barring would be the result. And now you could get any kind of Orpington you want, basically. What surprised me is that the Cook family didn't just do the Buffs, the Blacks, and the Jubilee. They did a ton of varieties, right. including the modeled The model, the Splash. I mean, you can get a lot. Yeah, there's a lot. I think there's a Cuckoo. There's a Colombian. Yeah, they're that, really neat. There's all different kinds. So if you like that body shape, you can get so many different colors. The problem comes into finding them. Right, right. That's where the problem comes yes. in. Yes. Now, the Jubilee showed up in the U.S. in the shows in 1901. At the time, Madison Square Garden was a really popular place for chicken right. shows, and they showed up there. But at some point, the breed disappeared in the U.S., there's also a historical legend about them floating around. Oh, yes. And I've read this one also. Uh -huh. Basically, they were a Royal Britain bird. Okay. And they were kind of like the bald eagle to us. They weren't exactly that, but they represented Britain. That's what this myth says. Basically. That they're this sort of patriotic emblem of Exactly. Us. Okay. So we were both reading and talking about it. I do a little bit of history <laughs> research now and then. And the myth says that Hitler destroyed most of these birds because they represented Britain in yes. Germany. And you know, that made me go down a big rabbit hole. What I found is that there's zero credence to this legend. It's just a myth it's that's just out a myth, there. Yeah. It floats around a lot. Well, as a historian, I can tell you that anytime you have this terrible person in history, there tends to be myth around them that they did this, that, or the other. What is far more likely is that if they were being bred they're not great layers. They probably were consumed and not rebred. Not rebred, exactly. But I went down a rabbit hole with this, and there's zero evidence of the Nazi party ordering the slaughter of any kind of livestock whatsoever. So if someone knows of a repository of documents somewhere, go ahead and write your master's thesis on it, because it could be, <laughs> I mean, it could be an interesting question. But it could I, be. I found zero things to justify yeah. this. Jubilees have been in the UK for over 100 years, but only have arrived in the US in 2011, imported by Greenfire Farms. Yeah. So they're not APA recognized at this time, but Greenfire Farms is one of those farms that does the best they can to bring a breed in, keep the breed going. I don't think they still have them right now. If you look at the Greenfire Farms blog from several years ago, they were using them in a breeding project, but some farms got them from Greenfire Farm. Right. So what do these beauties look like? Big. 
Big birds. <laughs> Fully grown hens are six to eight pounds. Roosters weigh about eight to 10. Is that about standard with buffs too? Yeah. So buttercup is probably between seven and, and a half and eight and a half uh-huh. pounds. Okay. They are very large. When you pick them up, it's not a one hand pick. No, no. They're big they're, birds. They're two yeah. hands. That's that what my got. brahmas are that way too. Big birds. And they're big birds and they're just beautiful. Their waddles and their combs come in multiple different sizes. Yeah. I have bubbles and buttercup and buttercup's comb flops. Uh huh. And bubbles almost has no comb. Yeah. So there's some variation. I mean, they were variations. They weren't bred for show birds. Right. If they were bred for the show pen, you'd see a moderate sized straight comb. Right. Small waddles on the hens. But because yours are pet quality, are you, you saying work. mine are pet quality? What yeah. the heck here? They're royalty in their own. Yes, they are. <laughs> yes, they are. They're we'll royalty play. of the backyard. We'll play <laughs> God Save the Queen when we let them out. Oh, bring me my tea at four, please. One of the things that sets the British breeds apart is that in England, white skin on a chicken used to be favored. So your Irvingtons will have white legs and feet, and the body should be very heavily feathered. I like to bring that up a lot because that is like what they're known for, man. Yeah. I think in England, they're in what's called the soft feather category, literally meaning they have all these big, soft, loose feathers. Yeah. Down yeah. feathers. Yep. Basically. Yeah. And it's like you try to get to skin and it's going to take you forever. They're like still going oh, through. Oh, so much. I know. It's so much. So but much it's feather. really, really cool. If you've never seen a Jubilee Orpington, and you should Google it because they're gorgeous. They have dark mahogany reddish feathers. They look like a chubby speckled Sussex. They do. They have that sort of black bottle green, green spot on the end of the feather. With then the they green have, iridescence. And then a white spangle on top of that. And like you said, they look like speckled Sussex. But what distinguishes them from speckled Sussex? There's multiple things. If you look at a speckled Sussex, their body resembles more of, let's say, the well summer, a stand-up as, chicken. I think of, actually, I think of the speckled Sussex as sort of low and broad, like the dorking, kind of. I'm probably not using the right words to describe how I think of Sussex, but yes, Orpingtons are like low a carriage. basketball with some feet and a head and a fluffy tail. And if you look at the speckled Sussex next to the Orpingtons, if we went out and looked at the lavender next to Katie Tebiscuit, right. there's lots of air for Katie. Yeah. But the lavender, not the, much. Low to the ground. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I feel like putting them next to each other all the time, I really see the difference. And she's big, but she's not big wide wise. Right. So she's essentially not what we're going to say, I think, is the big difference between the two of them is one, there's no speckled Sussex in their bloodline. No, line. they just look alike. They're cousins but, of some sort. But if you put them next to each other, the confirmation yes. and the fact that they're soft feathered with all those masses of feathers really is the difference between the two of them. Yeah. Even when I post videos on Instagram, people can probably even see it because I have Katie and the Lavenders, a yeah. lot of them. Yeah. When you see that low carriage body, uh-huh. it's Warpington all the way. I find their head very distinct. I have found that if you're looking straight at their face, I could pick out an Orpington every time. They just have a very distinct face. It's very small. And that's the thing that people love. That's one of the things I love about the Orpingtons is yeah. their body shape. They're very distinct. That's for sure. They're not considered strictly a heritage breed because they're not one of the APA recognized colors. Somebody was asking me this question, in my opinion, on it on social media, and they liked the lavenders. Uh-huh. That's when I post pictures. And the lavenders are beautiful. They're gorgeous. Orpingtons. Gorgeous. And I put them in the category of all the other Orpingtons, right? right? So the originals are the black and the buff. Right. And to me, that is the original heritage breed. That's just the way I look at it. Uh-huh. Now, when you deal with changing that original to different color wise and everything else it's a little off so somebody's asking me like i want to get heritage breeds and i want to get the lavender if you want exact heritage breed without anything you're going to go with the black or the buff or right because essentially the orpington itself is a heritage breed it's just that some of the varieties are not apa recognized and so you're getting an orpington which is a heritage breed but you can't show them with the APA is what that other, comes down to. And the other thing is to get certain colors, they're not breeding an Orpington to an Orpington. They're yes. breeding different chickens to different chickens yeah. to get a different Orpington. Well, exactly. Like the Cook family did. Right. They bred other varieties in and crossed them out again. So that's not a set heritage breed at right. that point. So that's why it's like a fine line. An Orpington will always be an Orpington in whatever color variety. Right. But there is some modification to the genetics once you make them into Splash, once you get modeled. Cuckoo, whatever. Jubilee, 
any of the colors. So just understanding that, that they're an offset of the buff and the black. Right. So for this purpose, I'm just going to refer to them as a heritage breed, even though it's not a recognized color. Exactly. Because what I'm about to say is that like most heritage breeds, they are slow to begin laying. Oh, they don't lay until like six months or more. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing is, if everybody out there, anybody is interested in learning about the lavender Orpington, we do do an episode all about it on, on Patreon, Patreon. Yeah, where we discuss the whole entire breed of the, the, the lavender and how that, the genetics got yeah. to that point. It's that really, was really interesting. That was fascinating, in fact. So check it out if you're if that interests you. The other thing about our beautiful Orpingtons is that they are not amazing layers. They are not. And I've seen them listed a lot. I know. I got the great me. layers, and I'm like, they're not. Why? Because they're not. No, they're not. You've got Buff Orpingtons next to a Leghorn. Yeah. And you would know. Yeah. Even in their first year, they were maybe two to three eggs a week. Yeah. They're just not great layers. They go broody a lot. Uh Uh-huh. So you're not going to get eggs during broody. Right. What they are is like kind of what I called them before, the golden retriever for the family in the chicken world. If you want pretty, pretty birds that are going to give you, say, enough eggs for your family, you're fine with Orpingtons. Right. But if you're looking for a huge amount of eggs, no, not your Orpingtons. If you have a couple kids, you want to raise chickens in your backyard and you want to have, let's say, six Orpingtons, that'll be oh, enough be fine. just for your family. You're not going to be giving away a ton of eggs. Right. And it's enough just for you to eat, to bake with. I hate to say it, but they're not great layers. You know, I love the Asiatics. Yeah. They are not egg machines. They're when just not. Big, fluffy chickens that yeah. are cuddly. Yeah. It does not equal great layers. No, it doesn't. And I mean, that's why it kills me when I see this coming out on many I different seen, things. I have seen the Orpingtons listed as, as a top layer on so many <laughs> lists. I'm scratching my head. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, has this person ever kept Orpingtons? In the really pro, fantastic category, Orpingtons are very cold hardy. Very, very. But then on the other hand, they are not heat hardy. That's true. <laughs> so Fans, you, if you baby. have Orpingtons and you're in a very warm area, say Florida, the South, any place like that, you are going to need fans because the heavily feathered bodies get yeah. warm very easily. Fans, shade, plenty of water. I feel like we're kind of, you know, go over a little bit of Orpington, but that's okay because Orpingtons are so popular. Yeah. But the Jubilee is going to be the same way. You're going to have to keep them comfortable. You probably want lower roosts because you don't want them jumping too far and risking leg injury. They are very big chickens. Mm-hmm. We've been told that many Orpingtons prefer to sleep in their bedding and not on the roost. I wish. Mine are on the roost. Fiona's love the bedding. I know. The other absolutely unbeatable thing about the Orpington is that personality. Yeah. The golden retriever of the chicken world. <laughs> I think when the girls and I went to the feed store the very first time and the four of them were there, and on the other side were Rhode Island Reds, yeah. a whole bunch, and then there were these four little Orpingtons. And I remember just turning to someone because I didn't know about chickens that many years ago. What about this breed? And they're like, they're the yeah. golden retriever of the chicken world. And they're right. They jump up, they sit on your lap, they snuggle, they look to be touched and petted. I think they're hilarious. Their personalities, they're a little bit haughty. I just love them. Yeah, and they really think that they are something. But you get the flip side, so they're not going to be machines and egg laying. And that's like one of the only downfalls. The other thing we didn't talk about, which I've mentioned a few times, is broodiness. Yeah. Warpingtons go broody like crazy. And they're supposed to be very good mamas. I mean, ask Fiona. Yeah. They are. So that's going to be something you're going to be dealing with getting Orpington. So just to be prepared. I do have several breeds that will go broody. And one of the things I end up doing, and I know not everyone could do this, but I collect eggs manically. Yeah. Because I feel like a broody hen can be triggered by two eggs sitting in the nest box for an hour. Right. And a change in temperature within 10 degrees. Yeah. Josie used to start as soon as it would go from 40 to 65. Yeah. She would start, and, it, and you're like, no. <laughs> and then it would be 40 the next day, and she's sitting in the box. And I'm like, yeah. are you kidding me here? So, yeah, that's one thing to know. They do that a lot. That's one reason why they don't lay that many eggs. That's true. That would cut into their, their laying time. It. Right. So, like we said, they're not recognized by the APA, but there is an active club in the U.S., the United Orpington Club, and they can help you with breed standard and things like that. In the U.K., the breed does appear in the British Poultry Standard, but there's another really good club there, the Orpington Club of the U.K. You can connect with breeders there. And where can you get them? Where can you get them? That's the big question. You have to search. Right. So there are some private breeders. The the one that I found that I really like to look at the birds was Carolina Rare Chicks. Yeah. And they definitely got their stock from the importation of Greenfire Farm. You're definitely finding them in hatcheries now. Yes. And if you need to go down the route where you have to have Merix vaccines, which we strongly encourage, yes. and you're trying to get a bunch of different breeds together, some of the hatcheries may be a good bet for you. Yeah. 
we not only preach that, we do it. That's, oh, yeah. Anything that we say to do, we do ourselves. Yes. For sure. And we are all about Merrick's and vaccinated Absolutely. against it. So, yeah, you can find them. It takes a little search. But who doesn't like a little search on the Internet to find what you want? That's good times. <laughs> My favorite thing, a cup of coffee and I can search for some chicks. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yes. So there you are, the absolutely drop-dead gorgeous Jubilee Orpington. If you have them, send us pictures or tag us. We would love it. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals health products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. Are you looking for a vintage small farm feel for your egg packaging this year? Or are you looking to develop a unique brand image with custom packaging? The Egg Carton Store offers a wide variety of recyclable cartons, customizable stamps, poultry care products, and a robust customizing tool to design your own labels. Plus, they offer fast, free shipping on all cartons and labels. Visit eggcartonstore.com for all of your egg carton, label, stamp, and poultry care needs this spring. Okay, so now coming up for our main topic is an interview that we did last month. Right. And we've held it for this very special first week in March because we are showcasing chicken ladies who have done something to help society. Extraordinary women who have contributed in some way to the chicken community. Yes. And our next guest is the founder of one of the largest and most successful chicken rescue operations this in was the world. such an honor to talk with Jane Howard of the British Hen Welfare Trust. She started this with a classified ad in the newspaper. Yeah, her story is amazing. And her story is amazing. And she has saved 850,000 chickens since she started. And we got the privilege of chatting with her for over an hour. It was awesome. And we're going to bring that interview to you now. Enjoy. That's an amazing introduction. It doesn't sound like it's me, really, but (laughs) that's really kind of you. Thank you. And I feel incredibly lucky that I'm doing what I'm doing because this has become a life passion for me. And, uh, you know, we spend so much of our working, our days in our work roles. And to be doing something that you absolutely love is is just, yeah, it's it's a great privilege, actually. It is very special. So do you want to tell us a little bit about how and why you started the British Hen Welfare Trust? Yeah, it goes back to when I was a teenager. So we all want a cause when we're teenagers. And uh, I watched a program called Down on the Factory Farm. And uh, I was, I think I was 18 at the time. And, um, you know, my heart just immediately went to the chickens. It showed veal calves and it showed all sorts of different unpleasant things, you know, um, sows in crates. But It was the chickens that caught my attention because they were in tiny battery cages for a year, out of sight, out of mind, never stood on solid ground, never saw sunshine, and then just went to slaughter. And I thought all these animals, and there's more of them than any other animal in the sort of agricultural industry, and, and nobody even knows about them. There's no connection. You know, the food that we eat and the animal that produces it, there's zero connection. So I saw that program, immediately became vegetarian, and I just knew I wanted to do something. So I started lobbying with my own MP. Um, But even from that early age, I knew I didn't want to fight the egg industry. I wanted to understand the egg industry, and I wanted to do it in a very positive way. And actually, I've got all my early letters that I wrote, and I got some lovely responses back from my local MP and things like that saying to me how refreshing it was to actually have somebody that's not just piling in saying that's cruel that's horrible stop it so that from the day one when I even dreamed up the idea really stood me in good stead that right there it's brilliant because it is so many things these days in the modern world they have a view on this side a view on that side and they want to fight to get what they want Instead, this is sending the message that we don't want to fight against you. We want to fight with you to make this more humane on these compassionate, kind animals that are giving us these eggs. That right there sets you up for success. 
If you think about it, you know, I can say it really hand on heart. There might be a tiny few farmers, but the vast majority of farmers don't choose to be in that industry because they hate hens. They're in that industry because they want to work with animals. And for me, very quickly, what I realized was that because consumers are drip fed, certainly in the UK, a message that, you know, cheap is good. That was where the pressure for the farmers came from. And, yeah. and it's, it's wrong. If it's tin baked beans, it's inanimate. It's not sort of not the same thing. But when you're talking about an animal that's actually, you know, you know, at the root of this, it's not right to be looking at cheap being the governing sort of um, aspect, really. I can remember my first television piece going out on national TV, and I was so nervous because I thought not only are people, consumers going to be watching this, but so are the farmers. And all I did was have a hen in my arms that was feather bear, and she told the story. I didn't have to say anything about that chicken. I knew that she would tug the heartstrings that I wanted tugged. I hoped that the farmer would not really notice it in the same way. And it worked. It really worked because I had consumers and supporters flooding in to help. And the response I got from the egg industry was that that I was very fair in what I was saying. That really did set the platform and, and the tone of what I've tried to achieve. I think you take tried out and you achieved. To work together with people is immense. Let's make a change together versus butting heads. Now I'm going to move on a little bit to the next question. And that is, did you keep chickens before you started rescue work? I'd never even stroked a chicken. <laughs> I really <laughs> haven't. That watching the show struck you so much that you were like, I had to do this. So you hadn't even had any chickens, but do you have them now? No. And how did that first batch, bringing them home, inspire you even more and change your life? It, it really did inspire me more, actually. And I'll tell you exactly what happened. I moved to the country. I couldn't wait to go and find some chickens. And of course, they don't advertise. Battery units don't advertise. So I trawled country lanes until I found one. And I went in and I had a little mini sized car. And I said to the farmer, can I have a dozen of your chickens, please? And he said, actually, yes, you can, because they're due to go for slaughter in a week or so. And um, I went into the farm unit and was immediately struck by the smell, the darkness, the noise. And of course, it has to be like that in a way, because that from the farmer's perspective is, is productivity. But it was shocking. And I remember saying to him, no, I'll take more, I'll take more. And I ended up going home with 36 rather than 12. That's um, amazing. You just lose count. You, I just lost. I put as many in my car as was safe to do. And when I got them home the other end and I was unloading them into this lovely little area that I'd prepared with my husband for them, there was one in there that had what I now know was egg peritonitis. And of course, I didn't know at the time. It, she was very penguin-like in her stance. And all the other chickens spotted her and immediately started to attack her. I thought, oh, my God, this isn't what I expected. This chicken who I had only just met waddled over to me, craning her neck up, realising that I was able to help her. I don't know how that works, but that's what she did. And I picked her up, moved her into another area on her own, called her Vicky, took her to the vet. The vet said to me, no, you need to cull her. She's got to go. And I just looked at Vicky and I just said, there's no way. So she came home, we got through it. She used to pot her into my kitchen, get in the dog's bed with the dogs. She came back in to lay. I got her a friend and the relationship that I built with that single chicken was that next stage that I needed to make me think I need to do more. I need to do so much more. This is just to get a few hundred for myself is not good enough. (laughs) That story is amazing. I, I think everyone needs to know the emotional capabilities of the chicken. Yes. Because without knowing that, it's hard to get in there into the trenches and try to help them. You're like, they just lay eggs there in the backyard. But the more that we learn about chickens and have them near us, we know they love and yeah. we love them. Yes. And I have a special needs chicken myself right now. And she went through two surgeries for crop oh. issues. 
she went into cardiac arrest on the table. Oh, right. Oh, gosh. She resuscitated her on the table, and now wow. she is my beloved. And, wow. she made it. and now she's back to laying eggs wow. and, and everything else. So it's That's just, fantastic. You've obviously just, got a very good vet, Chrissy. We do. we do. She comes on the show with us. She's amazing. She's a chicken lady herself. She Dr. loves yeah, Dr. Rebecca Ganaris is our vet, and she specializes in domestic poultry. Yes. And she wow. is wonderful. Yeah. Wow, okay. That's really yeah. interesting to know. Okay. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the special yeah. needs end up being the ones that take your heart the most, you know, and they need the most help. So I can 100%. see how that's... Yeah. I had a little flock a few months ago now um, of six hens that were really not suitable for rehoming because they were all a bit sort of below par and a bit weedy and, um, you know, one or two looked as if they might not make it. And I bought, bought them home and two in particular were bad. And one of them I had to spray with a bit of blue antiseptic spray. So she got the name Blue, which is just awful. <laughs> she was terrified of me when I first had her. And I had to sort of um, help her to feed. So, um, you know, hand feed her. And um, that chicken now is, without doubt, she's the standout chicken, the most friendly. I, she hears me walking towards where they're kept. And I can hear her trilling at the top of her voice. Oh. She's coming. She's coming. <laughs> and she wants cuddles and uh, just amazing. And she's, out of the little flock of six, she was the one I had to put the sort of the real care and attention into. And it's, mm. it's that same old adage, what you put in is what you get out. Yes. We say it all, all the, the time. time. <laughs> Especially with breeds that sometimes have a reputation for not being as lovable. We say if you get them very early and you put in a lot of love, no matter what somebody says is the breed standard, you're going to give back what you put in. <laughs> right. Of it's course. so true. Of course. I absolutely agree. Jane, what do you think are the most important achievements of the British Hen Welfare Trust so far? Without a doubt, getting hens on the agenda and, and increasing their popularity as pets. When I started, I think they were sixth or seventh in, in popularity. They're now fourth in the UK. I absolutely am determined to get them right up, up there under cats and dogs. Yes. Um, and, you know, creating that. That's the core objective, really, is if people see hens as pets, that changes their whole mindset when they go yes. shopping. And exactly. that will raise welfare. I don't have to show grisly images and things like that. I'd far rather do it in a sort of a the carrot rather than the stick way. Yes. And we know that when we rehome all our lovely little flocks of birds, we know that that little educational pack that we send off is going to win win the hearts and minds of the people that keep them. It you know it spreads further. The neighbours come and see them, and then the work colleagues get some of the eggs, and then family and friends get to hear about it. And you know it's it's just such a lovely way to sort of grow the popularity of the charity and hens yes. you know hens as pets that's what we keep saying always hens as pets hens as pets we were right there with you we want to get them to number three for sure with veterinary care yeah with just care in general we know the love between a hen and us now, what do you see happening with the people when they take these hens home? Do they write back to you how enriching it is in their yes, life? They do. do they tell you these hens treat them differently knowing they were saved? They always yeah. say this about puppies. When you save yeah. them from a shelter, they're grateful yeah. forever. I feel like hens have that capacity to know definitely. that also. Yes, yes, definitely. Absolutely agree with you. When you first introduce somebody that hasn't had hens before to chickens, I think sometimes they might look at you as if so oh, she's a little bit sort of, you know, a little bit over the top here, <laughs> not quite sure where she's going with this. Mm -hmm. And then you get the feedback and you get that the most common phrase that we get back is we had no idea they were so life enriching. Cannot imagine life without our hens. And that for me is another tick and it's job done. Who's next? And I love it. You know, the power of the girls to actually change how farming is done, farming practices are carried out, is huge. You leave it to them, they're completely capable. Because, as you know, they're such characters, they're such individuals. Yes. You know, 
it's like cat, we would not treat cats and dogs as we treat chickens. And I know there is cruelty to cats and dogs, but this is, you know, what happens in the agricultural sector is, is driven by profits and livelihoods and consumer demand. And I'm not berating any of that because it's a fact of life. But I think to you know, to be able to influence that in a positive way and bring the industry and the consumers along with you is the most powerful way to make it actually happen. I think when somebody first gets ahead, her life has started in the farming, in the egg industry, but yet when she comes out, she still has so much art to give and so much, and then goes back to trust people again Definitely. and say, you're going to take care of me. Yeah. And no, it's such a big prop to the hen at this point that they're willing to put themselves on the line and love I don't, I don't know whether you have experienced it over there, but certainly here, still, we occasionally get a flock that is, as we call them, oven ready. So they, for some reason, the farmer's got something wrong, whether it's the feed mix, the lighting, and they'll come out in, in pretty poor condition. And yet, ironically, we find that people almost get more, not enjoyment, more reward from seeing those hens develop and flourish and blossom into beautiful, precocious birds that we know they can be. And certainly, I've never come across another animal that copes with adversity as well as chickens. You know, when you look back at the battery hen system where you had four birds in a tiny cage and they couldn't even flap their wings or turn around, you think, how did they even survive in there? Exactly. Let alone lay an egg a day. So, you know, they are extraordinary in their capability, really, to make the most of what they've got, you know? Resilience is their number one character. But that's not a reason that doesn't make it okay. So, you know, I I love the fact that over here, you know, when I started, there was just over 30% of birds free ranging. Now we're well over 60%. And by 2025, there are a lot of countries that are looking at going cage free. That's an amazing milestone. So on a personal note. What did it mean to you to be awarded the MBE for your work with these hens? <laughs> we had to ask that question. <laughs> um, it was a massive surprise. I immediately broke the law when I heard. I, I just moved house and the letter arrived at my old house. And I opened that they'd rung me up and said, there's something for you here from the cabinet office. And I thought, oh, I don't know what that's about. So I opened it up and started reading it aloud. And it said, dear Mrs. Howarth, the Queen has asked us to write to you and something the Prime Minister or something like that. And it went on and said, under no circumstances must you tell anybody about this award. <laughs> I was just reading it to the two people I just sold my property to. <laughs> okay. So I had to say to them, on pain of death, you will be sort of, you know, um, <laughs> held to account if you breathe a word. I was completely blown away. I had absolutely no idea that was coming. Even when I went to Buckingham Palace, I remember uh, before we actually sort of went to, I was um, given my award by Prince Charles, but I can remember people saying, yes, I'm here for sort of services to the local community and I'm here because I've done something else amazing. And I said, well, I'm here for chickens. <laughs> just did a double take and just said, what? But it was such a conversation starter. So, yeah. Did Prince Charles chat with you at all? We know he keeps Orpingtons. Did he chat with you at all about chickens? He did. He just, you literally have, it's so orchestrated, obviously. But he did say to me, um, it's about time I saw you here. I'm really pleased to see you. Because Prince Charles had earlier in the life of the charity, had sent me two fabulous letters of support which I really treasure. And, um, you know, he he was right behind me. And he, I mean, he remembered, which was just amazing. That's so, fantastic. You know, yeah, it was good. It was a really very, very special day, actually. Yeah. You yeah. deserve that. You deserve I had a feather there. in my bra. I had a feather from favorite chicken in my bra. There, <laughs> oh, needs to be, there needs to be more people like you out there. That is amazing. And people don't understand you go somewhere and chickens, it's a conversation starter for people who don't even have chickens. They're fascinating to talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when we started are. the podcast, people were like, you're going to talk about chickens. You're going to run out of stuff to talk about. We're like, no. Tip of the iceberg. no. We're at the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I know. I know. Well, you know, world domination for chickens, it's coming. That's right. That's right. It's so well deserved. I mean, the numbers are staggering. I think we looked at um, the British Hen Welfare Trust has saved 850,000 chickens. 
Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's just, yeah, it is amazing. Even I'm amazed. When I first started, my ambition was to save a lorry load, which was about 4,000 at the time. You know, I just had this image of saying, no, don't turn right to the slaughterhouse, turn left and bring them all to my home. And that would be wonderful. And of course, yeah, we've done lots and lots of lorry loads. So yeah, I'm, I'm, that I'm thrilled. I can't wait till that number hits 1 million. I, I know, me too. Yeah. <laughs> that is yeah. amazing. Yeah. I can't amazing. wait. There will be a big party. Okay, so we're going to switch it off a little bit because we like to get to know you also. What kind of hobbies do you do? Do they have anything to do with chickens? Ever since I started the charity, because we are so unique, it has completely taken over my life. There is no doubt about that. So downtime is much needed. I've got dogs and I love to walk my dogs. I've got um, two Italian greyhounds, one of whom is quite poorly at the moment. And I've got a little sort of scruffy thing that came from a little um, rescue centre. I'd always wanted Italian greyhounds for some reason, so they're not rescue. Other than that, I've always had rescue animals. So I love spending time with my dogs. I love gardening. And actually, just in the evening, I love sort of slumping on the sofa, chocolate. And yeah, I usually nod off, actually. But it's just lovely. Yeah, that's my downtime. I kind of, yeah, I miss things like um, reading books. I don't seem to sort of get time for things like that these days. Mm. What is your favorite flower? My favorite flowers? Probably the roses. Yeah. Yeah. I've not been, I've only been here for just under a year. So it's kind of all new um, and I'm really enjoying that. So I I spent a lot of money on plants and flowers last year and I'm hoping they all thrive and come up. And the chickens on, they're in a certain, I've got a really nice long back garden, which is theirs. And then I've got a big front garden, which is not theirs. (laughs) (laughs) You cannot eat this Right. Do you have a favorite rose? I'm a rose lover from way back. Do you have a favorite? Oh, gosh. Now no, you're asking me. It's got to be um, something like the Gertrude Jekyll one. Yeah. And okay. anything Gertrude Jekyll, I absolutely adore. I just adore her whole styling. So, yeah, she's very much my favorite. That's a beautiful rose. That that true rosy mm, pink color. Pink. Yeah. Really beautiful pink. Yes. Got yes. One just outside my kitchen window. <laughs> that is nice. That's nice. So will you please tell us a little bit about your current campaign where you're urging consumers to switch to smaller and mixed size eggs? Yeah, it was really interesting. Such a fascinating thing that happened last year. I was asked to give a talk to the Guild of Food Writers, and I was very aware that it was an influential bunch of people that I was going to be talking to. It was online because obviously it was covid They wanted me to talk a little bit about the charity and then they said, and anything else you'd like to talk about? And I thought, well, every now and again, I raise the subject of the egg size. And I know that for the industry, it was always a big, it is a big problem for the industry because the reason it kind of came about is that consumers, again, think that big is better. You get more egg for your buck if it's a big egg. And so the supermarkets constantly want to sell large and extra large eggs. Therefore, there is a pressure on the farmer to get his hens to lay bigger and bigger eggs. That can cause all sorts of issues. More calcium needed for the shell, which leads to sort of bone fractures, and that can, can cause prolapsing. So, and you know, the ridiculous thing is, as you will know, that if you have a medium egg and a big egg, the size of the yolk in the medium egg will be exactly the same as the size in the big egg. Most people prefer the yolk over the white. So there's lots of logic as to why this is just a marketing nonsense. Mm -hmm. So I started talking to the Guild about the size of eggs and actually the impact it has on hen health and all this silliness about the need for a large egg. And the president of the Guild of Food Writers, Orlando Murrin, was also listening. And he just has been the most amazing support. And it's just rocketed from there, really. He's helped me to influence national magazines. Like over here, we've got BBC Good Food magazine. We've got another lovely cookery magazine called Delicious magazine. We've got a few clothing companies. We're gradually sort of spreading the message. It's definitely a long-term sort of uh, campaign. But it's asking people to stop using large eggs and buy mixed weight eggs, which allows hens to do what comes naturally. And it also allows farmers farmers not to feel the pressure and it doesn't devalue the smaller egg so everybody wins first for me the hen 
Secondly, probably, well, it doesn't really matter, the farmer, because he's not losing out and he doesn't have that pressure. No farmer wants his birds to have prolapses. That's no good for him. Right, no. and, and thirdly, it's better for us as consumers because the yolk to white ratio is improved if we go for the smaller egg. And right. because I've now got this fabulous support from the Guild of Food Writers, they're the people that are writing all these menus and recipes for magazines and gradually you're seeing the word large dropped from recipes so it's really beginning to make a difference it's a great example where i love collaborating with the egg industry so we've done pr together we've done radio interviews together i've done television with them we managed to get it out on national tv so it was you know just a great opportunity to get chickens out there chicken welfare a really really easy win for consumers don't buy that box buy that box it also Um, helps what does the farmer do with the smaller eggs if the industry won't take them where are they going they get cascaded down into the liquid processed market Okay. So they, they would be used for things like quiches and cakes and stuff like that, but it greatly devalues the egg. Exactly. It, 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 there are so many nonsenses. When a, um, a hen reaches point of lay, and again, the eggs are small, uh, nobody wants them. So they all end up in the process sector. But the irony yeah. of it is they're probably some of the best eggs she's going to yes, lay. Exactly. Exactly, the pullet eggs. Exactly. So that's interesting because here in the U.S., if you are selling as a small producer, you can't sell mixed size eggs. It's insane. There's no logic to that. We don't want to have small, medium, and large. Why cut? And, you know, we find that people, I know when I give away my eggs, people love the fact that some have speckles, some have, some are small, some are large. You know, if you can, you've got variation there. It's interesting. It, it's a bit like um, white eggs and brown eggs. I think over there you prefer white eggs. Is it's that changing. Right? It has it's changed okay. in brown. It's so funny because as a backyard farmer, if you want to sell your eggs, you have to jump through lots of hoops to get them to the point where you can legally sell your eggs. So, so many backyard farmers just give them to friends and neighbors because they're not set up to sell if they're different sizes, if they're not a great egg. Every egg is different. So for it to fit into this nice little 12 egg carton where everything looks alike is hard for the reality of it. The grain A and grain B part of it is very, very difficult. I was going to, at one point, start selling eggs and I gave up and I just gift them now for that reason. Yeah, exactly. Over here, you can sell eggs up to a flock of 50. Beyond that, you have to register and you have to have salmonella testing, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we've got a great little scheme, our egg club scheme, where people offer eggs to friends and family in return for a donation. We don't make a charge, but they make a donation to the charity. So, and it's great. It's a great little fundraiser for us because, you know, as as we know, I mean, I've I've only got 13 girls, unlucky for some, and a, and a cockerel. And, you know, they're regularly popping out six, seven eggs a day. Well, <laughs> yes. I, I love eggs, but I can't eat that many eggs. Right, so. right. Which sends us to our next question. And this is one that is so dear to us in our hearts is veterinary care for chickens. What can we do, U.S., U.K., together to bring about a change? We want normalized veterinary care for all of our chickens. We want our vet students to be taught in vet school how to treat the chickens. You're going to love what I'm going to say now. We've got three things on the go, and and I can't give the absolute detail of one of them because it's not yet come to fruition. But for a few years now, we have been working with somebody in America, and we are looking to bring out a vet diagnostics and treatment tool that will be available online and that we hope will attract global attention. We've been working together for quite a while and it's taking us quite a long time to get it all together because there's so many things we've got to cover. But, you know, we're so excited about it and the difference it can make to hen welfare globally. We've got the potential to help spread it and grow it. We've got the marketing and the structure behind us. So, yeah, we're doing it as a 50-50 collaboration and I'm really proud to be doing it with her. The other thing that we're working on, which we're hoping, well, we hope to launch Easter this year, and we've been working on it for about five years, 
We are producing a five week course designed for vet students and qualified vets. And that's all about how to diagnose and treat a pet chicken. I love it. Amazing. We're working with the University of Nottingham over here and they it's called a massive open online course and it will be available hopefully early summer, latest, if not Easter. And I don't know if you guys know Kate Humble over there. She's a TV presenter here. She's a patron of the charity and she's just done a sort of video introducing the course and so it's really exciting. And that's just going to go into so much detail, anatomy, diseases, surgical procedures. I'm lucky enough to have the most wonderful Italian vet here. And when I first met her, probably 15 years ago, actually, I knew more about chickens than she did. She's just amazing because she's broken all the barriers. She's learnt on the job. And she really is now known in the whole of the south of England for what she does with poultry. And we've videoed her doing um, operations So, you know, surgical procedures like a spay on a chicken. Your vet obviously does crop impactions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and my vet does crop impactions and all of the common ones, really. A bumblefoot. Yes. um, You know, eye cysts, infections, all sorts. She'll try anything. And blisters, all those different things. The information that she's got in her head and the skill that she's got in her hands, probably as your vet, Chrissy, it needs to be out there. And you know, part of the work that we're going to be doing in our collaboration with our colleague in America is to sort of focus and bring in people like our vet, your vet, so that we can showcase them and we can sort of say, this is possible. It actually, you know, it's possible to do this for a chicken. And it matters. It's so exciting. It is. Yeah, that that gave me chills because after being a veterinary technician and animal nurse for 15 years and being in the industry myself, People who are in this industry are there, number one, because they love animals. I can speak from my own experience. Mm. When I was a little kid, I would take the doctor's kit to the neighbor's dog and try to listen (laughs) to the heart. And from very young, knew I loved animals. My life would be animals. And that's the majority of people that are in veterinary care and they want to help. It's the knowledge, bringing them the tools. We've also this year for the first time, we're offering out vet grants to students So we're, you know, research grants, sorry, research grants for vet students. So we've just had some really exciting stuff come in. One of the vets, actually, she's a qualified vet, wants to do some quite detailed research into what causes egg peritonitis. Now, Mm -hmm. we know that egg peritonitis, particularly in the commercial sector, is reasonably common. So I'm just so excited. It's got to go before our scientific research committee. But I'm optimistic that, you know, it will get through that okay. And it's just so exciting because there's nothing out there. There is nothing out there. Jane, do you have a link to the application process on your website? Yes, we do. So what I'll do is in the podcast show notes, I will link to your website and put a specific link to the research grants. Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, We we only offer them in the UK at the moment, but I'd still be grateful for it out there because even if we did draw attention internationally, I'd still be really keen to see what reaction we got from that. Yes. I really think it would be a good reaction because generally the people who are in veterinary medicine are there because of the love of animals and any way that they can help. Going through, there's so much schooling. It's not like a a doctor. You're learning the human body and that's one body. You know, like you have to learn all these different bodies in veterinary medicine. So it's a lot for them to learn. So it's definitely ongoing. What we found over here when we spoke to vets was that they, you know, their course is something like seven years long. It's, it's incredibly long, yeah. but, but they they literally get to spend a morning on how to treat a flock of 10,000 birds. Yeah, and yes. they, you know, we have vets, we've got our own hen helpline, which we're just trying to get funding for, actually, because we want to bring in and, and actually be able to sort of tap into a vet direct to improve it because we're getting course from all sorts of people, you know, not just people that have got our own hens, but people that have got, you know, pure breed hens. And we want to be able to help those people. So our hen helpline is there. We're looking to increase our funding so that we can expand it because there's definitely a need for it. 
But, you know, we, we even get vets call us up and ask our advice as to what we would do. And, of course, we can only say in our experience, and if it were my hen, this is what we would do. Right. But we're changing it. You know, this is all set to change it. And for sure, it's very, very exciting. The final one we're doing is we're actually challenging the body that dictates what drugs can and cannot be used for birds. Because as you will probably know, they slip between the nets. They are not deemed pets. They're deemed livestock because they are food producing. So we're dipping in quite deeply in a very polite, non-challenging way. But we've got some fantastic support from a law firm specialised in charity area of ethical work. And they are helping us to peel away all the barriers to hens having access to what are deemed normal drugs for other animals, including right. painkillers sometimes. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it's wrong that you can give a mouse or a, a rabbit something if it needs it, but you can't give it to a chicken in case you eat the egg. Now, over here, there are certain antibiotics, of course, that are used broad spectrum through all small animals, but yet they're like, we can't give it to a chicken because of egg producing and other things. But in the U.S., they also have something called a Compassion Act. So the vet does have the ability to override it if it's reasonable for the compassion of the animal. They can actually give it and not be in legal trouble. We, we have similar similar over here. It called, uh, and it, we just use a disclaimer. So a vet can... As long as the owner signs a piece of paper to say they will not eat the eggs, they can get the drugs. But it's very woolly. A lot of vets are not clear on what they can and what they can't do. Exactly. So we're trying to bring together all the right people that have got the knowledge and they've got the authority that we can get them in a room or, you know, a virtual room to discuss it and get clarity on it so that Normalize. there is more knowledge out there for that. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. to normalize all these things. And you can't expect an animal to take such a popularity boom in the last five years and stand still. Absolutely. These animals are out here with normal people who aren't medically trained. They need someone standing next to them and saying, I am trained to take care of your animals. And then people think you're going to have chickens in your backyard living happily and nothing's going to happen. It's false. Yeah. You can be the best chicken keeper in the world and something's going to happen. Of course. (laughs) And you have to be prepared. Yeah. You know, we're on the right path. That's the thing. It's not going to happen overnight. And and I'm a great believer in doing these things sort of properly, thoroughly and in in a positive way again. I'm really pleased with progress so far. So at the end of this year, I'm really hoping that we've got some of these things off the ground and, you know, research into some common diseases like egg peritonitis, diagnostics tool up and running and that five week course, which is going to be accessible by any vet anywhere. So yeah, really exciting really exciting that's amazing and we will keep in touch with you on that so on a less positive note but still important we know that you're suffering from avian flu with some of your migratory waterfowl right now what impact has that had on the british hen welfare trust adoption process it's devastating it just stops us in our tracks so we haven't actually laid a hand on a hen in a commercial unit since just well, probably early December. Oh, yeah, wow. about the 8th of December. And it's heart-wrenching, really, because yeah. previous time we had avian flu, it shut us down for about four months. And I think we worked out, we lost about at least 12,000 birds. Oh. And our supporters are amazing because they still continue to book them for when we can get going again. We don't think we'll be going again until probably the end of March. But we've got well over 2,000 hens already booked. But it's so frustrating that we can't can't get there. But I understand that it would be foolhardy for us to just willy-nilly, you know, keep going because we've had the worst outbreaks here than ever before. We've had over 70 outbreaks, Mm. which is unprecedented, unfortunately. We're getting them here now. Oh, are you? Three identified about 10 days ago in North and South Carolina. And apparently there have been a couple of cases in Canada and Newfoundland. Wow. With waterfowl. I I wish they would do more research into the source of this. I don't want to get political, but I think there's an awful lot that needs to be done in terms of welfare and hygiene and biosecurity out in the Far East. And, 
I know politically it's not very easy to do that, but it's such a major problem. Hopefully, with it being more global, we'll get more resources on it. I hope so. It's, you know, the, the interesting thing is it hasn't detracted from people wanting to keep chickens as pets, which is fantastic. And I suppose my theory on it is the more hearts and minds we change and the more we can influence shopping habits to spend a few extra pennies on higher welfare, hopefully that will reduce the frequency of these outbreaks because yeah. in my view it is down to welfare it's down to lack of hygiene but you know none of us know the complete answer on that one right we've had a few episodes out where we talk about avian flu and how to prepare your flock and what to do making sure water's covered food's covered they're in an enclosure yeah. they can yeah. still be in a large area it just has to be enclosed yeah. There's lots of things that we can do to help protect our flocks. Have you shut yours in at all yet, Chrissy? In the U.S., we have such a high predator rate that we have large runs oh, already. Yeah. So we can't free range as much. Right. We do supervised free ranging. So right now they're in an enclosure with food under and right. just to be cautious. Yeah. What yeah. we would have to do essentially is wrap the another tarps. layer around our existing runs. Yeah. My okay. husband and I were talking about that last night. We were trying to plan. We have seven large runs that we will have to enclose, <laughs> but forewarned is forearmed. So we are prepared. Yeah, absolutely. We that. We're learning all the time. You know, mine are very lucky in that they've got a large polytunnel, but not everybody has the space to offer them that kind of thing. And it's a question of keeping them entertained and engaged because yeah. they really do get depressed. They do. Yes. They really do. You know, you have to keep going in with different things. You know, I snip grass for mine now, which initially I thought, oh, this could be dodgy, but actually it's it's been brilliant for them. Right. And there's a huge difference between giving them mowings from your lawnmower, which is a, an absolute no-no, to actually snipping fresh grass mm -hmm. and giving them a handful sort of once or twice a day. I think that's been an, a lifesaver for mine this year. And they, of course, get other sort of treats through the day. Um, and you have to vary the treats. You know, don't bring the same thing you bought me yesterday because that's boring. You know. <laughs> Speaking of treats, we have to ask this because we want to know. Are there any celebrities that have adopted battery heads? Yes, there are. I was thinking about that one. I thought, oh, I don't, don't know if you all know them then. They're possibly not international. So Pam Ayres, do you know Pam Ayres? No, oh, no, you don't know Pam Ayres. So. <laughs> she's, she's a big name over here, very big name. Russell Brand has we yes, adopted our yes. chickens. <laughs> and I don't think you'll know Chris Evans. He he does. Yeah, yes, oh, yeah. okay, you know Chris Evans. Chris Evans yeah. went to collect his chickens in a white Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah, Those that was fun. Wet in style. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and who else was that? I do know that Jennifer Aniston is keen on chickens. She had chickens, and Jerry Horn used to keep chickens. So, oh, okay. Yeah, and Selma Hayek was is apparently keen on chickens, but nice. they haven't adopted ours. I was trying to think of who else. We've got some lovely patrons because Jamie Oliver is a patron yes. of the charity and he has our, had our chickens. I don't know if he has now. Okay. The Duchess of Richmond, she has our chickens. Okay. So we've got a few, a few in sort of very grand places. So, so yeah. Lucky girls. And then we've got, I know they are lucky girls. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. So what are some of the things that people in the UK and the US and any of the rest of our listeners around the world can do to help British Hen Welfare Trust further your mission? Well, I really am keen to expand. I'm not saying we can do it this year necessarily, uh, but one of our key aims is to have more exposure globally. I don't mind where the hen is. If she needs help, she needs help. We are now up and running in France and we have an associate charity out there. And that lady that runs that, Heidi, she and I, you know, work closely together, but she has put in so much time and effort and she's growing rapidly. The French are a little bit behind the UK in terms of welfare awareness, mm -hmm. but they are now really 
getting interested in it and the timing is pretty perfect so she's rehomed in her first year about 15,000 hens wow, which is more than I did in my first year so it really bodes well at the moment obviously they're stopped too because of avian flu I'm keen to expand and you know anybody that is interested in sort of setting up something then yeah you know get in touch Obviously, I'm extremely busy with my own charity because it's because we are the first of our kind. Whichever direction we look in, there is growth. Um, For example, we're looking at Henson's therapy, and that's the next big thing that we're just about to open up this year. Anecdotally, we know that whether people have physical um, disability or whether they have mental health issues, we know that chickens are incredibly powerful in making people feel better about themselves. So that's a big area of growth hopefully for us this year and I'd love to replicate it it's a model that works and and I think you know the key things are to be respectful and to have huge amounts of passion and determination because I had no experience in what I'm doing and I've done the whole thing from ground zero and if I can do it anybody can do it but it has taken over my life (laughs) you're amazing Oh my goodness. I just wish there were more people like you. Well, there (laughs) probably are. We just need to unearth them and find them. Right. I know the first thing that our listeners can do right now to help support is go on Instagram and follow the British Hen Welfare Trust. Yes, please. Follow their social media. That's an easy thing to do. I can link all of those things in our show notes. That's fantastic. Yes, please. Staying on top of things that you're doing because they're so important. In the U.S., we'd love to have a joint thing going on where we're working together for the battery tents. We do know that on the West Coast in California, there are some startings up yeah. of adopting out ex-battery hens. Partnering with someone as amazing as you can definitely speed up the process in helping these hens. And for our listeners, it's all a follow, a follow. Go and yeah, see what they're absolutely. all about. Check out your website. It is amazing. It's also Definitely. very easy to donate from the U.S. Yes. Right. You okay. the donate button and yeah. you don't even have to try to convert the dollars. It's all automated. No. It's all automatic. And so, the way yeah. I want everybody, our listeners to know is that if you're donating to the U.K., you're donating to the greater cause. Yes. Because this is where the help is starting. Yes. And if we help support you, then the yeah. help will come over to us. It no. will. You know, it's, it's my dearest wish is that, you know, this just carries on rolling out right across other countries. And so, yeah, I'm pretty determined. <laughs> and yes. I want to do a lot more before I drop off my perch, that's for sure. Okay, so what future would you like to see for laying hands? I'd like them to all be allowed outside to be able to scratch and root wolf on the ground for bugs and slugs, feel the sun on their backs, feel the wind ruffle through their feathers, get down and have a dust bath. I just want them to have a natural, normal life. And, you know, I understand and accept that we need to do it on a commercial scale, but I just think we should replicate as closely as possible what is natural for them. And, you know, look at how they repay us. It's amazing. Not only do they give us delicious eggs for absolutely ages, they also make the most wonderful, life-enriching pets at the same time. I mean, it's just incredible. There's no other animal that gives what a chicken gives, really. We moved on to calling them companions because that's what they are. They are. I want a day where if I want to go on an airplane with my companion pet, it can be a chicken. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> we did have a man that he was a he was a bus driver and he used to take his chicken on the bus. And of course it was, <laughs> it was a great thing for the local papers and what have you. Gertie, my special needs little girl, she has a stroller and she goes everywhere with us. So if we go to a festival, we go to the store, she goes in the stroller. And I'll tell you what, ambassador chickens are changing the world one chicken at a time. I can't walk three feet. She's in an enclosed stroller without somebody saying to me, I've never seen a live chicken. I've never touched a chicken. Right. Exactly. And, And to have that awareness out in my town. Yeah. My husband and I will go to the local brewery and get a beer, and she sits in the stroller next to us, and she is the superstar at the brewery. Like, there's a million dollars. I love it. And no one cares. It. And right. one chicken there, and everyone's snapping pictures. Oh, what's she called? Gertie. 
Gertrude is her full name. Oh, I see. Gertrude. I only call her Gertrude when she does little naughty things. Out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fantastic. I love it. If you think about how many hearts and minds that Gertie has changed, you know, that's yes. that one clever little chicken. It's amazing. She is an amazing little chicken. <laughs> So we ask all of our guests this question, even though it's not a completely fair question. At all. <laughs> but we always ask, what's your favorite breed of chicken? Oh, it's easy for me, that one. My favorite breed has to be the hybrid because of what I do. Funnily enough, when I first moved to Devon, I set up all these little different chicken houses and was going to have different sorts in each one. And then, of course, I got stuck into what I do, and that was that. But I, <laughs> I, if I'm looking at pure breeds, oh, my God, there's so many. Um, probably the little Bantam Cochin that, or the, the little Pekin. I, a touching chords here. I would say I the pink. <laughs> oh, I adore them. Chrissy I loves the pink them. I used to have a little lavender peking cockerel because I always have one cockerel. Oh. And he was called Tony. And he used to stand on my hand and whisper sweet nothings in my ear. Oh, oh he my was goodness. just to die for. He was gorgeous. Coaches were my first breed. And it's a a funny story because after we finished college and before we started graduate school, my sister and I went to England and we went to Chatsworth House. Oh, yeah. And we happened to be there on a day where the big buff coaches were wandering around in the garden. And we took one look at those chickens and we were done. (laughs) So we came came home and we ordered ourselves some coaches and some other chickens. Oh, beautiful. I was maybe 20 years old at that point. And I've never been without chickens since that moment. Wow. I fell in love with them. They really do have to. I mean, we always send ours out with a sort of a a, a warning, really. You know, they are addictive. So just be warned. They are definitely addictive. On a slightly related note, do you know what type of hybrids are the most common in the UK? The most common types would be gold lines, high lines. We've moved a bit more into the white breeds. Shavers, we have several of those now. But high lines and gold lines, I think, are the most common. Okay. We've been doing research lately into the development of a lot of the hybrid breeds because they do have their own stories to tell. Yeah. So it would be interesting to look into these breeds and do a little Yeah. Interesting- My colleague Gaynor would possibly say a few more. I'll ask her actually and let you know. Okay, thank um, you. But yes, those are the most common. I, incidentally, one thing I haven't told you is that we haven't done it for a few years, but we used to save at least one flock a year of the broiler breeders. I love that. Oh, I, I love adore it. them. They are so cute. We used to call them our little roasties because you have to have, <laughs> you have, to have a sense of humour, so don't you, doing what we do. They were so adorable and they always came out with little bowed squat legs where oh, the big cockles had been on them so many times and, and they all had sort of wounds or, you know, feather bare necks and what have you. But they were the sweetest, sweetest nature little birds and, and would carry on popping out eggs. But we found it very difficult for a number of reasons to sort of carry on with it, even though it still breaks my heart. And actually, yeah, yeah. it's hard to talk about them. Yeah, I mean, they're I adorable. Really miss them. They're gorgeous. Yeah. And yeah. they need help too. Exactly. They do. I think we can do it. One chicken one podcast at a time, we can get the message out there to everyone across the world. Thank you so much, Jane. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Talking with us. We could chat with you for hours. <laughs> Easily. <laughs> March is Women's History Month in the U.S. And so you are kicking off yes. our oh, Women's History Month. Notable thank you. Women. Notable Women in History. Yes. Oh, that's so kind. Thank you. That's lovely. It's just so lovely to speak to people that are as passionate about chickens as I am. So we have yeah. loved this. And yeah. our listeners will love you and our listeners will follow you. Yes. That's fantastic. We definitely need to keep in touch. I'm Absolutely sure there's will. much more we can do together, actually. Anytime you want yeah. to be back on the podcast, we will yeah. be more than happy to have you on. That's so kind. We Thank so, you. We need to come visit you. I will say yeah, that right. Please. <laughs> do. please do we that would be wouldn't that be lovely COVID stuff is over get over to the uk yeah please visit. do we would love it yeah it would definitely. be amazing thank you so much for That's talking okay. with us you're very welcome it's lovely lovely to meet you, you bye 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 We just want to thank Jane Howarth one more time for taking the time to sit down and talk with us, answer our questions. I will have links to the British Hen Welfare Trust in our show notes. 
And while you can't adopt hens from the UK here in the US, you can make donations and you can buy things from their online shop. Yes. Thank you, Jane. That interview was so inspiring. It gave me chills. Yeah. One more time, Jane. Thank you again for sitting down and giving us this interview. It was amazing. Okay. So now it's time to move into cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. This week's cracking the eggs, we figured we would go with something that went well with tea. Yeah. Or and coffee. Or coffee. It works with either one. It's one of my favorite things in the world. Yeah. So I love we're them going too. with wild blueberry scones. And you know the reason that I went with wild blueberries? Because they're wild. Because they're wild. <laughs> because they're smaller and sweeter than most of the blueberries that you buy in, say, the grocery store. The big blueberries? Yeah. Have you ever seen the jumbo blueberries? I have. They're kind of mind-boggling. <laughs> I love them. Okay. They're big blueberries. Big blueberries. So this is specifically the wild blueberries, and they sit better in the scone, too. The big ones don't really work in the scones that well. You can find them frozen, but the only thing you have to watch out with using frozen produce is you have to make sure it's so dry. Defrost it and make sure it's really no, dry. No, this recipe, you use them frozen. You use them frozen yeah, in this you, one? Yes. All you do is toss them with a little bit of flour, and so because they're the small blueberries, they distribute they the way. too much moisture into nope. your dough? Nope, nope, nope. I've never really used like the frozen fruit too much in my baking. I'll just buy the blueberries. Oh, I'm lazy, so I figured out how to do it. <laughs> Seriously. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. They must be really much smaller. They're much smaller. Like a third of the size of the average blueberry that you buy in the grocery store. Okay, you got Gertie listening because yeah. she is a blueberry hound. She's ready. She's like, did you make these scones? <laughs> so the the other thing that really makes this recipe stand out is buttermilk. Yes. And again, if like me, you're stuck never eating dairy, you can just use a cup of, I like oat milk, and throw a tablespoon of vinegar or lemon juice in there to help it curdle. Correct. There's your buttermilk. Yep. Other than that, this is really straightforward recipe. Flour, sugar, baking powder, salt. Making your, sure your butters and everything are super cold. Right. Your frozen blueberries, cube the butter because it's just easier to cut in. It's basically your simple putting all your dry, cutting in your yep. butter or your dairy-free butter into your dry mixture. Right. I mean, you can't go wrong with these scone recipes. Right. And this one has one egg for richness, yes. essentially. And some vanilla for your flavoring. And you can change these a little. I make glaze that goes over top my scones. Uh-huh. And just do the powdered sugar. Well, that's what I wrote into the recipe, just the simple powdered sugar glaze. Yeah, but you can change that flavor so easily by adding the extracts to yes, it. Yes, you can. And you can get them natural. They don't have to be imitation right. or whatever. I have been a big fan of the maple lately. Oh, yeah. So I just take some maple extract and uh -huh. pour that in and then put that over top the blueberry scone or okay. a plain scone. And the blueberry would be awesome with the powdered sugar icing with some lemon extract. Yeah, you could do lemon. I have, lemon and blueberry goes really well together. I have, What do I have at home right now? I have lemon and almond. Almond might work. Now, another thing that you can do is you can chop up either meat-free bacon, turkey bacon, or regular bacon. Uh-huh. And you can put it on top of the icing if you use it. Yeah, like you maple. could, actually. That's an interesting mix of flavors. It's like salty and sweet together. Yeah, yeah. But scones are so good. They're really easy, too. You mix up your dry ingredients. Right. You mix up your wet ingredients. You cut the butter into your dry ingredients. Then you pour all the wet ingredients over top, mix them up. I mean, it really is that easy. I always do like a well. Like, I kind of yeah. put it to the yeah. side and yep. then slowly mix it into the well of the wet. It's one of my favorite things to make. They don't take that long, and they're so good. They're so, so good. You can make them so many different ways. You can add chocolate chips in them. You can do anything to make it your own. They go great with coffee, tea. So do you do what I do? I wrote the recipe the way I like to do it, which is pat them out into a circle and then cut them in wedges. Do you do it that way? I do triangles. The wedges are kind of triangular. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I roll them out. Oh, I then... don't roll. I pat. No, I roll I told mine. you I'm lazy. I don't want to wash my roller pin. <laughs> I pat. <laughs> I roll mine with a roller, and then I use a pizza cutter to cut them. Girl, you are so much fancier than me. <laughs> I'm patting that with I'm my hand. It's easy. It is. And the kids love it. And I usually top mine with a little bit of sugar before they go in. Uh -huh. Give them a little bit sweeter. A little, I'd use the Demerara, the coarser sugar. Me too. A little sprinkle of that. So quick, easy, but absolutely delicious. Coffee with a friend. Yeah. Make them. Show us your pictures. Love to see them once again. Tag us. We would love it. So now it's about that time that we go into retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So today's retail therapy, we're going to be talking about the shop for the British Hen Welfare Trust. Oh, and isn't it amazing? It is amazing. And the thing is, if you 
cannot adopt from the British Hen Welfare Trust, then you can help out by shopping at their shop. You can, yeah. And there's so much stuff on there. They get a lot of people who sell their goods regularly to donate to them. Yes. So you're going to find wonderful artists like Rebecca Marshall on yeah. here. And they donate to bring money in to the British Hen Welfare Trust. Right. So if you buy your favorite artist's goods through this website, a chunk of it's going to go to the charity. Exactly. Which is just excellent. The other thing is, if you go to the shop, you can get close to everything you need for chickens on this shop. Yes, you can. So let's go through the categories that you can shop. Chicken feed. Chicken bedding. Grit and seeds. Chicken supplies. Clothing. Gifts. Products to help with avian influenza. Mother's Day gifts. Easter gifts. And special offers. Yeah, that's, that's a lot That's a of lot stuff. of shopping. Yep. So if you want to go and you want to buy something from them to help support them in their mission to save, they're almost to a million chickens saved. This is just it's amazing. blown my mind. Yeah. And you're not in the UK. You can still help them. Right. By going to their shop, looking at their goods. It's really fun to look at this website. All the stuff that you can get. And they do ship through a lot of the world, including the USA and Australia. Shipping costs are going to be higher. Right. But I can tell you that the things you're going to buy on here, you're not going to find too many other places. No, they're different things than you can find here, which makes it kind of fun. Yeah. And you know that this money is going to help yes. rescue these chickens. Yes. They have really cool t-shirts I on here. love so many of the t-shirts. They're so cool. You can get them in a short sleeve. Yep. Long sleeve. They have polo shirts, sweatshirts, hats, so many different things with their logo. And the gifts... Oh, my goodness. The gifts. I really think I need one of these zip-up fleeces with the logo on the front. I know. They're so amazing. So great. You have gifts for the hens. Yes. You can get a hen swing. Anything that you can think of. Oh, my God. Look at this little treat feeder with the comb. Too cute. That is so cute. The treat baskets. All these different gifts for your hens. Gifts for you. And that's where you're going to find the gifts for humans. Rebecca Marshall has right. given lots of her artwork. Which we absolutely adore. love. Yeah. Rebecca's amazing. Yes, yeah, she is. And she has actually adopted from the British Hen Welfare yeah. Trust, too. You can just donate if that's what you want to do. Yeah. So, I mean, just to go in and shop and know that that money is going to help save a few more of these ex battery hens is amazing. And checking out their entire website, actually, yeah. and seeing all that they're about. Yep. It's pretty amazing what one woman started via a classified ad in the newspaper. It's fantastic. It is. And the store, if you like the shop, there's no doubt in my mind that you're going to find something you like in here. Oh, I found so many things that I like I in here. I found so many things I like in here also. Yeah. And knowing that it's going to help save these chickens yep. is amazing. The other thing we should mention is they are starting to adopt again. Yes, yes. So if you are listening to this in the UK... And you've been waiting because of the avian flu closure. Yes. Well, the adoptions are starting up again. So you should go onto the website and see if it's in your area and see if you can help out. I know that on Instagram, they've been putting some pleas out there for people to yes. for. This episode has been one of my all-time favorite episodes. We got to talk about a lot of fantastic stuff and to talk to someone that we very deeply admire. Yeah. I mean, for all the work that she has done for yeah. the chicken mm -hmm. in the UK. The U.S. is much ahead. bigger than the U.K., but the fact remains that we can learn a lot from the work that Jane and the British Hen Welfare Trust have done. Listening through the whole episode and listening to Jane talk, it takes a very, very special person yes. to work alongside of something that you think is so wrong and to help yeah. change yeah. and to use working alongside people to make a change versus going against. Right. She could have said this is all or nothing, but cooperation was the key to this. Yes. And I think that's something that we should pay attention to. And that's something that I will always take away from this interview with yeah. Jane. We had such an awesome time with her. So it's been an awesome episode. Should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? Next week, we're going to be spotlighting the very rare Rhode Island white chicken. Has anybody heard that there's a Rhode Island white out there? Yeah, because we told them. <laughs> we're interviewing Diane Twinings, who is the founder of Roost and Root Coop Company, one of the only coop companies in the U.S. that sells 100% made in the U.S. coops that you can assemble from a kit. And she's another amazing chicken lady. And yeah. you're going to find out from this interview, another one of my favorite interviews. Yeah, it's fantastic. Our recipe is classic coffee cake. And retail therapy is Haiti Joe Coffee, which is a charity that Diane has founded. 
so amazing. Mm-hmm. That's why March is one of my favorite months. <laughs> yeah, it's been great. These women are amazing and talking to them and spending time with them just inspires both of us to even do more. Yes. So what should we tell everybody to do? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. Don't forget. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening.